Kapai. Okay, well, tēnā koutou i te iwi. Uh, this is Carl Burrows from Haka Works. I'm with Jamie Tutu today. Uh, tēnei mihi atu ki ao koutou. Um, we're on Haka in the Matrix. And why Haka? Haka is what we do. It's what we love. And also in this particular case, it represents our traditional knowledge that has been, been passed down to us by our ancestors. And Matrix, well, you remember the movie uh, Matrix when Neo, he was navigating his way through the various worlds uh, and doing so he finds his own life purpose. Uh, we do the same. Um, we navigate through worlds, whether they're spiritual, temporal, geographical, cultural, um, and in doing so we find our own um, purpose as individuals and communities. And we're lucky as Māori because we have these, um, what we call taonga, uh, these, this knowledge that has been passed down to us from our ancestors. And um, it helps us um, realize who we are. Uh, and it's something that's really precious to us, but also it's something that I think we should be sharing as Māori with the world. But I th there are issues around that um, to ensure that what we do is um, we maintain the integrity of what we do uh, in the knowledge that we've been passed down uh, to us. So this is what we're here to talk about. And I've got Jamie Tutor on the show. Uh, and I'm just going to um, bring in... Jamie, in a minute, but before then, um, what we do is, is our tradition. We um, just want to acknowledge you all with a mihi um, in te reo Māori, in our Māori language. And uh, and then we'll do a karakia, and the karakia just gets us in the right frame of mind to make sure we achieve what we do um, going forward from here. So the mihi is just about acknowledging you all here and while we're here, and also to acknowledge our ancestors. Um, and then we'll get Jamie on. So um, while you're waiting, make sure you uh, drop us a line so we know that you're listening and watching. So just want to say tēnā koe, uh, Ronice, you're saying bonjour from Paris, um, and anybody else, um, most welcome to say uh, where you're uh, listening in from at the moment. So tēnei mihi atu ki a koutou katoa, wakarongo mai ki tēnei uri, o taranaki me ki ko, ko māo ko Jamie, uh, no taranaki maunga, uh, kei ta mihi. Kei ta mihi anō ki a koutou e, e, e Ko tāi mai rongi te kaupapa te wāko, me ki ko tēnei taonga anōhuki, ko ngā taonga tokuhiko, nō ngā mātua tupuna. E tika ana ki a huri ki a rātau, ngā mate o te wā, ngā mate e takoto ki runga, i ngā mara e maha o te motu, ngā mate haere, haere, haere atu rā. Rātau ki a rātau, tātau ki a tātau, a tēnā koutou. Ko rangi ko papaka puto ko rongo ko tāne ma huta ko tangaro, ko te matau enga, ko humi e tiki tiki ko tāwhuri māti. Tuko na tarangi ki runga ko papa ki raro. Ka aputa ko te iratanga te kita oi iao ki te a mārama, ti hae, mauri o rā. Ka huri ki a koe te tōkana, te rangatira Jamie, Ngāti Mutunga, meki ko Ngāti Maru anō hoki, nai mā haramai ki tēnei hōtaka, kia ora rā. Tēnā koe, Karl, o tino tēnā rā tātou katoa. Tai ranga mai ko te motu, tai ranga mai ko te ao, tēnei te mihi ki a koutou. Kwa rō mai ki tēnei pū wānanga, ki tēnei pū kōrero, i wāinga nui i a māua ko kāo i tēnei pō, nō reira ko te uri nō tēnei o Taranaki maunga, e mihi nei ki ngā maunga katoa te motu me te ao, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tatau. Kia ora. And just to all our listeners out there, I know there's a few, I can see a few listening right now, so... Um, if you want to say where you're listening from, that'll just help us get an idea of who you are and where you're from. And also, um, this is a really a great opportunity to talk to um, someone really knowledgeable in uh, managing Māori assets and knowledge. And um, so if you have any questions for Jamie while we're talking, do feel free to like share some of those questions on our on our um, page, on our chat, and um, we'll put those, put those to Jamie. Jamie. Uh, but again, Jamie, just to, to acknowledge you, thanks for coming on our show. Um, it's just a really great opportunity for us to hear someone from someone um, of your uh, experience and knowledge um, on here. So, tēnā koe. And I just want to ask you first, I mean, I'm sure you've asked, answered this question a million times, but just a little bit about who you are and your background. Just really interested in, in what it was being Māori for you growing up and how that ended up... Um, you being in the position you are at the moment in terms of being on quite a few boards and, and managing assets. Kia ora. Oh, well, I was, um, <clears throat> I'm from a little place called Urenui in North Taranaki. That's where I was uh, born and raised. Um, had the opportunity and privilege to be raised by my grandparents. 
uh, alongside um, a number of other family members, whānau members, um, in a house which had extended whānau. Um, but being living in Uranui, uh, being part of our, our iwi community, being part of our marae, so our place of gathering, um, gave me an insight, gave me that sort of lived experience of uh, being Māori, basically being Ngāti Mutunga. Um, my grandparents were heavily involved at the pā, at the marae, um, and so naturally uh, we were also a part of uh, serving our marae um, and our iwi community. And so I was fortunate to be, you know, to have that have that experience and to be just to be part of the Fano at the Marae and um, and having some wonderful mentors and role models, um, being around the language, being around our culture, um, being exposed to uh, the experiences, the history, the narratives of our people. And so really fortunate. And it was really through that that I have had a number of opportunities to get involved in, you know, a lot of the work of our iwi and also Taranaki and throughout the country. Yeah, so they, they sent you away for a little while as well, didn't they, um, to go to school? Yeah, so, yeah, so, um, so I went to Urunui, Urunui Primary School, then went to Manukurehi, and then the old man, um, encouraged by some of the other whānau, so some of his nieces, uh, to send me off to Hatopetera College, so a Māori Catholic boarding school in Auckland. Um, and, you know, given I was one of the, well, the first of our immediate whānau to be sent away to Māori boarding school, um, again, it was a privilege and an opportunity, and so one that, given the commitment that my grandfather, the old man, had made to support me through that, uh, making sure I made sure that I, I made the most of that opportunity in terms of, you know, the education that was provided, um, and how I would sort of utilise that, you know, moving forward into the various things I've done. Are we talking Uncle Bill here, Uncle Bill Tuta? Yep. 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 Bill Tuta. Yeah. 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 Lovely. Um, so somebody says the audio is doubling up. We're not sure what that means. Maybe, uh, Renice, maybe you're listening to two of us at the same time. Have you got two um, platforms open? Hopefully that's the problem. So, um, yeah, if you shut one down, let us know how you're going. That'll be great. Um, so just in terms of some of the things that you learned as Māori, what are some of the important values that you took forward into this mahi and uh, uh, in terms of working at the level you are now? That you took from home well i think you know like the first one was um you know these these the foundational values of whanaungatanga so those relationships um things like kotahitanga but one of the one of the the principles that my grandparents and the the wider whanau lived by was uh reference to a particular whakatokitanga kōrero so a, a a proverb which was kia u ki tō marae ma tō marae ka kia koe e tangata uh, which simply translated means if you are true to your marae and which really speaks of if you serve your marae and your community, you become a whole person. And that for me was something that, you know, there was an unwavering commitment from my grandparents and from the from the wider whānau in terms of their service to not only the marae but our iwi community. Um, yep. And I think for me it engendered that, I, th I think that commitment, that responsibility, that obligation, but I think it's something that I've always held dear, the importance of relationships, the importance of humility, um, and how you how you carry that with you in terms of anything you do. Um, there's been something, you know, from my, from my formative, my upbringing, it, it still sits with me now. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I don't usually want to jump this quickly to this point, but uh, I mean... Some of the, I mean, the issues, the values that you brought up in terms of, uh, I think you said kotahi tanga, whananga tanga, really important. Uh, but not many people talk about um, the last one you you raised in terms of, you know, your responsibility to to your community as a result of where you were brought up and how that impacted on you and and, and resulted in an obligation on uh, that you felt to serve your community. Yeah, well, um, I mean, it was it was actually not until I left home, yeah, and realized, you know, you don't realize what you have until 
you, you you move away and then you you get exposed to other people and their experiences and so you know really fortunate to be around you know people who were much older than me that had a huge range of lived experience through some really tough times um who were just so generous and so wonderful and so beautiful um having the opportunity because i was what what my aunties would call me a pakiki so a pakiki is someone who is always asking questions because i was very curious about things yeah. and the old man used to get a bit hoha with me as well because but it was like well if you don't know ask right um but it was really through that that inquiry that i started to get a really good sense of one what fascinated me was you know most of my cousins or i'd ask my aunties so why do we call such and such auntie how you know and i was really interested in relationships so how everyone related to one another so that's our whakapapa our whanaunga tanga um and then i was really interested in uh, just the dynamics of relationships um and then just what was important to people and yeah i think from a young age just because my grandfather was the chairman of the pa trustees yeah. so he was at the pa every day doing something you know if there was a tangi if there was a hui they were there they were supporting irrespective of who the family was or what the particular kaupapa was and so you know there's that concept of i mean it's overused now kaitiaki tanga um but when we when i think about kaitiaki tanga i mean kite you know as a kaitiaki whether it be in relation to the environment or to our marae or particular kaupapa um it speaks of responsibility to past and future generations um but also kaitiaki tanga reinforces the notion of our connection to place and you know for me one of the things that sets not only maori but indigenous peoples apart from non-indigenous or non-maori is the fact that the, our kinship our whakapapa connection to place yeah um, see i just want to come in here um first sorry i'm just going back to the point where um you know, in terms of your knowledge and your inquiry with your um, the people that are around you, and, you, and like you were saying, you do have you were lucky to have these people that were were with you, and not many people have that opportunity. And I'm thinking of myself growing up in Upper Hutt um, and Waikanae, and then eventually coming back to Taranaki. And one of the reasons was because I kept on asking too many questions, and and they kept on saying, "Well, go back home, go back home. You can find the answer there." Um, and I think of my own children, and I tell them. Um, my difficult story growing up, you know, and, you know, they've got their own stories that they have now. They go, Papa, that was the 70s, you know, it doesn't apply anymore. Um, I suppose, how does, how do we engender that sense of uh, community and responsibility to home now that so many of us are living all, over, all around the world and yeah, away so from that, home? That's, yeah, that's that, that's that, um, and, you know, that particular issue is what I think all iwi organizations and and whanau and families are grappling with now the fact that we are dispersed not only here in new zealand but throughout the globe and then i think that's the question of how do we maintain our identity or retain or you know maintain our identity and then how do we also maintain those relationships to both place and to our our, our broader sort of iwi community um and you know we i mean part of it is through technology now um but also i think you know there is something there is something to be felt by actually experiencing place in a physical and a spiritual way um and i think you know for us i mean and the big thing with a lot of my focus working with our iwi entities is you know the role and responsibility of our iwi entities to provide opportunities for our whanau to connect and strengthen identity yeah um and you know we've actually started talking now about given the distance given um some of the challenges that that whanau face reconnecting back to their iwi communities their tribal communities we've got to start by taking the part to the people so so you think about that conceptually how do you take the part to the people um, and the, the rationale there is is that you know we need to be able to first build that relationship that trust to inspire our whanau to one day come home to place yeah. and so i think you know 
you know, with, with my aunties and uncles, you know, when I was young, if I started saying, well, actually, no, no, you go out, you take the path to the people, not the people coming to the path, they'd say you're crazy. You know, that's not how it works, boy. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, one of the wonderful things about the Māori and our iwi experiences, we're very, uh, we are able to adapt and evolve to the circumstances because, you know, the pursuit of our, of our ancestors has always been one of, um, survival and being able to endure yeah and so i think you know we've got to go in with that mindset and we've got to find the tools and the ways in which we can connect to people use technology inspire through stories through narratives and then hopefully you know encourage or inspire people to want to come back home yeah um, see um this is really interesting because uh, a lot of this is a lot of this conversation now is really about the values that we have as Māori that our own people aren't able to engage with at home. And so, you know, you're looking at how can we take, I suppose it's, it's providing a platform or for lack of a better word right now in my head, uh, where people can see, hey, this is something I can connect to. Because there's fear about going home, you know, there's um, there's a whole lot of issues that we have. Why did our parents leave? Why are we, you know, why are we afraid to go back? What does that all represent for us as a person on going on an individual journey? That's really difficult. Um, but if we can sort of go halfway at least, you know, and say this is actually what it's about, and it's not that difficult if we start to engage at this level and um, can encourage people to go back home. Um, I want to move on to. Uh, um, just some of the issues that um, we deal with, I suppose, is, well, firstly, um, just I want to ask you a bit more, just to get a bit more clarity on some of the issues that you think, uh, or the values that Māori organisations um, adhere to, or um, propose to adhere to at least, you know, in terms of running their organisations. Um, so what are some of the values that are important to you as a Māori, as, as a, a manager of Māori organisations? Well, I think, you know, there's, um, the context is one of, uh, you know, we're intergenerational. So it's not a value, but I think if you think about the context is that, you know, it's this notion that we are immortal. Yeah. Because, you know, e kore ngaro, e no i rui rui mai rangi atea. So it speaks about the fact that, you know, we are, we are but one part of that, of that, of that chain. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's that piece. Um, another aspect is the fact that you know we we exist for for the the greater community good, and so that that speaks about the whole notion of collectivism, and that you know that's about getting the right balance to ensure that we're able to um, to achieve collective outcomes. And then I think the third element in terms of context is that we're very purpose driven. Um, yeah. And so when you think about being purpose-driven, uh, being intergenerational and, um, you know, doing things for the collective good, you then say, how do you do that? And it's yeah. the values that assist to guide us in the way in which we go about achieving the outcomes that we might set. set. And so, you know, fundamental values are, um, you know, reciprocity. Um, so the, the concept of manakitanga. Uh, manakitanga is 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 about sort of the care, but also it speaks about reciprocity and how we relate to others. You know, we've talked about the concept of fanaungatanga in terms of the importance of relationships. Um, there is there is a value of utu. Um, now utu has unfortunately been characterised in a negative way, but utu is all about how you maintain balance and harmony. Um, there are a whole lot of other values that. Um, we speak of and speak to in Taranaki things like manawa nui, which speaks about resilience, manawa roa. Uh, we have another value of manawa ora in terms of, um, yeah, so, so there, there's, a range of, there's a range of values that guide us. Um, but the approach I've been taking, Carl, um, more recently is basically using, well, they're, they're, they're like whakatoki, but statements, which um, the sort of tupuna wisdom, which provide context and framework to guide us in the way in which we go about the things yeah. we do. <clears throat> I think um, of um, Ngāti Maru, um, the example yeah, like, of the, the Ngāti yeah. Maru, yeah. yeah. 
so like with Ngāti Maru, right, so framing that on the, the Maui narrative, but, you know, Maru, yeah, all of those elements which, you know, speak to the fact that we as Māori selves as part of the environment, not separate to it. Um, and so we take a very holistic approach. And so, you know, uh, one of the statements we have for Ngāti Mutunga, for example, uh, speaks of he tai ao, he tai rangi, he tai nuku, he tai tangata, he tai ora. Um, and so that, that speaks to the fact that, you know, the natural world that we live in has, has te tai rangi, te tai nuku, so those elements above, below, but nuku and rangi also speaks to the tangible and the intangible elements of the world that we live in. Um, he tai tangata, the fact that we as people are, are just another element, another part of, of the natural world environment. And then, you know, we seek tai ora. Um, and tai ora actually speaks about uh, well-being and intergenerational sustainability in everything we do. And that, that reminds us that we can only have intergenerational sustainability if we have the appropriate balance and harmony between all of those things that make up the environment. And so, you know, I, I, I love uh, one of the statements that Sutipani O'Regan uses is that we must remember to remember. And so, you know, that that, that concept of tai ao, tai rangi, tai nuku, tai tangata, tai ora was something that huirangi would speak about all the time. Mm. You know, the very segments of the natural world that we live in and then, you know, who, who are the masters of particular domains like Tangaroa, Tāne, um, Tāwiri Mātea, and the fact that all of these elements, it's all about how we find that right balance and harmony. But but that's the internal, you know, that, that happens internally for us as individuals because we're constantly trying to get that balance and yep. that harmony. And so, you know, this wisdom, this knowledge is actually not only relevant for the collective, but also us as individuals in terms of our own our own journey. Yeah. yeah. Hey, just um just want to say there's quite quite a few people saying hi to us. So we've got uh Himi Gray, Tena Kora from Ngati Rangi. Kia ora Himi. Um and we've got Zia Jones. Zia Jones is uh from he's actually our chairman over here in London for Ngati Ranana. And Nathan Petty, Ngāti Maru in the house. Ka pai, kia ora, Nathan. Hey, um, so a lot of these values, if you can call them values or a framework, really, really which helps us understand how we look at the world. Um, you know, as you, as Māori go through the settlement process and we, you know, get um, money returned to us uh, that we have to look after and become kaitiaki of, and we have... Uh, these this new framework which which we have to manage our, um, we're looking at managing those assets within but also with the imperative of returning funds you know making a, a profit i suppose or ensuring that there's a, a positive return on on any investment that we make is there a, um, a tension between those two things and if so you know how do we resolve those things yeah, well i think i think the in terms of our evolution um it's about us finding those ways that reflect who we are and so you know when you look at the the experience that we have had to date as iwi organizations iwi institutions it's it's very much been modeled on the conventional approach um with a focus on the sort of financial capital um and that a lot of that activity has been guided by particular values or or constraints from a cultural sort of context perspective and i think you know, where we're, we're at an exciting time because it's all about how we recapture our indigenous aspects and how we imbue everything we do with those values, with those models and that approach. And so I think one example, Carl, is the fact that, you know, there are multiple capitals. So if we think about an indigenous or a Māori regenerative economy, and we look to decolonize the approach to risk, value, and impact that we've used uh, more recently. Um, it's about starting to look at alternative capital. So not just um, financial capital, natural capital, social capital, and cultural capital, but thinking about um, intellectual capital, spiritual capital, living capital, um, 
you know, material capital and the like. So I think, you know, we have the opportunity to develop models which actually speak to who we are. And our Ngāti Maru model is the perfect example there, yeah. you know, with yeah. Maru Pai, Maru Roto. So that provides that that framework by which we can identify what are the success measures under each of those particular po which speak to success for Ngāti Maru because ultimately it is for Ngāti Maru to determine what Ngāti Maru success is, not someone else. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, it's about encouraging our own iwi entities and our iwi communities to be confident enough to utilise our ways of knowing, our ways of being, our knowledge systems, because those ways of being, knowing and knowledge systems have ensured that we have endured. So why would we want to dismiss them today? I think, I mean, the difficulty is that, you know, a lot of us um, have been through this process of learning uh, through the universities here. Um, we go into businesses and we've given a framework and we measure our performance upon this this framework. And these values that, that were within this framework aren't Māori values. Um, and then we sort of become familiar with them. We become confident in them. And then we're going to work within Māori organisations. And then, you know, all of a sudden we're just thinking, actually, how do we change our own personal mindsets from how we've already done, always done things to... And also I think the other, the other difficulty is that they're, they're quite esoteric in some sense. Yeah. You know, and then you think, okay. Well, you, know, you got to make them real. I, I know what you're saying because, you know, yeah, because yeah, a lot of this is how do you make it real yeah. so, it, so it can be felt, you know, you can smell, touch, yeah. So it's got to be real. So how do you actually translate some of these values or these statements or this wisdom into practical, meaningful steps that people can see are being achieved? But I think, you know, I go back, we talk about decolonization a lot and there's, I know, when you look at the sort of global landscape at the moment, there's a lot of talk about decolonizing wealth in terms of the role of indigenous communities. And there's a lot of um, it, there's a lot of people talking about that. And I think we've got to do that. Um, and that's certainly something for me that I've been focused on the last sort of six to nine months and something I'm really keen to to continue to do moving forward because I think we're now at a stage where we can take back control and develop those models that are relevant to us understanding your challenge that you've laid out too, Carl, that, you know, how do you, how do you translate what can be seen by some as being very esoteric into practical everyday yeah. actions that can be. Cause I think in from. the end it comes down to um, we've got a, a limited asset, uh, a limited resource and decisions need to make, be made about that resource. And um, you know, I think this is where these things come through that you're saying, okay, I'm making this decision based on these values and I'm not making it based on these ones. And as soon as you start doing that and signaling that to the community or your stakeholders, you know, that's when change starts to happen. But I suppose we've got to get the knowledge first, don't we? Um, well, you've, got to get the, you've got to get the frame. I think because they're not, yeah, you develop the frameworks that speak to, I think, what success is to you. Because, you know, if, like for me, it's always about doing things your way. And, you know, like, why why have we bought into, well, this is the way you run a post-settlement governance entity or an iwi organisation, I think. Yes, there are some some constraints and limits and there's some some elements that you, you, you need to follow, but ultimately we can actually redefine how we want to go about, you know, structuring ourselves, managing assets. But more importantly, you know, what gives rise to how we make decisions? I've always believed that, you know, create, developing, getting, achieving financial returns has always been a means to an end. Yeah, That's not the end. Um, and often we get too caught up with the size of the assets rather than what the performance of the assets in terms of contributing to the, the greater well-being of the iwi. Yeah, um, I think with, um, so, I think the size of our balance sheet is tended we we associate that with our mana sometimes, um, you know, especially yeah. in the past. And I think that needs to move from there now. And so this is that I think that decolonizing process because when you think about, you know, um, mana enhancing activity, you can actually enhance your mana more greatly by working and partnering with others. Mm. 
you know, so we're bored in, you know, so this is, I think, for me, I mean, it's taken a few years, you know, but you actually have a bit more time to sit back, reflect and say, actually, you know, we, we can we can take things to another level. Um, and it's not saying we've done things wrong. It's just part of that evolution and that journey when you've had, you know, your your land base, your livelihood, your assets stripped from you. Yeah. And now just returned, you know, we're still quite young in terms of, okay. of, of, of that journey. So just on that point, so, um, and I'm, so in terms of you saying working with others, um, and I think just the journey for myself is maybe I can reflect on that. You know, it was all about, especially when we were in Taranaki and we were young, it was like about doing it for ourselves, Māori, by Māori, for Māori, by Māori. Um, and I just think there's a point now <clears throat> and that we're ready, I think, is that actually how do we work with um, create relationships with others to help ourselves grow? Is this what you mean? Well, I think there's, you know, it starts internally. So, you know, how strong and how... And if you were to um, to assess the, the the health of a relationship within an iwi, because as you know, if you're fragmented and he nui ngā kōrero, ngā wakatauki tanga kōrero mo tērā, right? So I think, you know, you've got to be strong in your own identity and unified as, uh, as, as an iwi as best you can. That then allows you to be able to, I think, partner with other iwi or other Māori organisations. What I like about that is that, you know, um, for example, we've got a collective investment involving all of our Taranaki iwi down here in Wellington with our Taranaki Whanui group here. I mean, and it's called Te Taihekenga because it's, it, it reaffirms the relationship that we all had when many of our people left Taranaki in the 1800s. So, you know, it's more than just partnering for a financial benefit, but it, it also... Um, marks and re-establishes sort of more modern day relationships and cements those relationships um so there's 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 a couple of those things but with any relationship or partnership you've got to be you've got to you've got to be confident in yourself um and you've got to be able you've got to know and trust the other parties and be very clear about why you're entering into a relationship and i think you know we can do it we when we haven't yet done it on a scale i think as maori that we could yeah um and i've always been pro pro maori and us, us doing that but at the same time i also recognize that there are opportunities should there be alignment in terms of purpose and values with other indigenous or, or, or non-indigenous groups that see the world we do and want to to achieve the same outcomes all right so um i want to move on to uh this quarter or that um well, firstly, I want to ask, because um, a lot of the work here we do at HakaWorks is about, you know, we, we work with organisations, um, huge companies, and they, well, for most of our work, it's about internal change. How do we create relationships within organisations to be able to create some sort of sense of unity? And they look at Māori and they think, look at these people and the way that they um, work with each other and they've got this energy and they've got this power and they've got this purpose and it comes through in haka. Um, how can we um, utilise some of that so that we become more uni unified and po more focused, more, less silo um, orientated? So, you know, we found a little niche within there for us in terms of sharing Māori knowledge. I just, just in terms of your view, is, is there anything that we can share as Māori um, with other people who aren't Māori? Definitely. I mean, I think from my perspective, I mean, I have a goal that, you know, if we're truly to be, um, to have intergenerational sustainability, um, it requires the globe to um, embrace Indigenous Māori values and models of development. Um, and so I think, you know, there's huge opportunity to share um, our Māori experience, our Māori narratives, the values. You know, when we think about some of the ceremony and ritual, I think we've got to remind ourselves that, you know, we have ceremony and ritual to reinforce those values, those narratives, that wisdom, but also um, it, it reminds us of the importance of those particular things and it's their, their role in terms of ensuring that we are um, where we are, we are we're going to endure. So I think, you know, fundamentally, Carl, from my perspective, um, 
it's a lot of this is about how we share. Yeah. Um, but I'm certainly one who um, sees the value in being able to open people's eyes and hearts and minds to the Māori world um, because as you and I both know and I guess a number of people that have been exposed to the work you do through Haka Works, they will see the beauty that exists within Te Ao Māori. Um, and I mean, I've had that experience with non, <coughs> non-Indigenous, non-Māori people where, you know, they say how lucky and fortunate we are. But I think, you know, when you look at some of the challenges that people may face within a firm or an organisation or whether it be in communities, I mean, a lot of this knowledge, a lot of these values, these approaches, um, these cultural practices that we have, um, have a very practical application and purpose because... Yep. They speak to leadership, they speak to unity, because as we know, if we don't have leadership, if we don't have unity, if we don't have a common purpose and understanding. Yeah. yeah. You know. So this is the, this is the um, appeal for a lot of um, non-Māori organisations or businesses over here in, in the other side of the world. Um, the other thing too is I read about the World Economic Forum and they were saying you know, there's an opportunity now to, you know, take, um, make, take the most, or make the most of... of the space which COVID has given us. Uh, and if we're going to regenerate the economy, uh, then there's an opportunity now to, to do it in a way which takes into account the environment. Um, and I just thought straight away, you know, there's for people to change that whole mindset um, in terms because most of you know, a lot of business is about exploitation, exploitation of, of resources. But if we can change that mindset um, of people in business, and make it more nature orientated and they use those words you know nature we need to take into account nature um you know there's it's going to make the world a better place and i think indigenous people need to be in that conversation um and contributing to that um so just what are your i mean at the same time i think we've all sort of come across issues where um some of this knowledge is being used by others in a way which is um not mana enhancing, I suppose, or enhancing of ourselves or, or our communities or that knowledge is actually detrimental. Uh, and how do we protect that knowledge? You know, how do, how do we stop it being misused? What do we need to do as, as Māori or practitioners to be able to keep it safe? Pātai pai tērā. <laughs> well, of course, you know, we've got, I mean, there are, there are very few restrictions really at, at law, right? Yeah. in terms of, um, you know, when we look at the Convention of Biological Diversity and some of these other um, global mechanisms that exist, I guess, you know, like, certainly from my perspective, uh, when I share our knowledge, our experience with others, um, I do it in a way and I, 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 I speak to and I remind those that are receiving um, any of these narratives and, and this knowledge, just, just, you know, he tapu he tahuene So, and when we talk about tapu, it's not that it's restricted, but it should be treated um, appropriately. And I think you know, part of the process of transmitting or teaching or sharing does require us to be able to impart on those that are receiving it those responsibilities and obligations that they have in relation to that body of knowledge, um, those narratives, and what is being shared. Um, and, you know, this, this goes back to one of those other principles, right? So, you know, the world and all of the challenges we see, but if we were to be true to these values we talk about in terms of kaitiakitanga, which, is, which doesn't speak about rights, it speaks about responsibilities and obligations, you know, if, if, if the, the broader sort of global community sort of viewed things in that way, you know, we may not have some of the challenges we do have, Um but as you say, you know, we've been in this vicious cycle rather than what I'd like to see, which is uh, creating a virtuous cycle. Um, and a virtuous cycle is all about balancing a range of factors in an integrated way. So balancing those various capitals that we spoke about earlier in a way. Um, yeah. And so, so I think that's all part of that journey. I think, Carl, around, you know, the people that you're dealing with, that you're educating, you know, making sure that they understand what yeah. what they've been given and provided, and and what's what's appropriate and what's not. 
Yeah, I think, um, I mean, interestingly, there's, I think there's, there's certain rules of knowledge. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes you get to a point where people say, oh, we want to know more, and, I, and I'm saying, oh, we want to do more. And, you know, we'll say, well, we've given you this knowledge so you can understand yourself because there are parts of you that have been hidden because of the nature of your culture. Um, Maori culture has ways of connecting to this part of ourselves really quickly. Uh, and this is the methodology, a process. So we've opened this up for you now, but it doesn't mean you're Maori. It just means that you have um, a way to access this part of who you are. So let's, ex you know, it's your opportunity now to explore that more fully. Then they want to know more, and they and and I think you know at this point, there's a point where this knowledge, and it's going back to what you said right at the beginning. This knowledge actually ties us for it to have a real meaning and application back to our communities. It ties us back to our mountains and our rivers and our our families and in the land and our communities, um, and that's um, where it becomes more real, I suppose. So I think yeah, there's one the level notion of yeah, because as you say, I think there's there's some universal you know when you think about some of the principles that we live by or the values we live by, there are some universal principles and values that all people yeah. people have, right? We yeah. we may. We, we, we may refer to them differently or say them differently, but ultimately this knowledge actually exists. These ways of knowing, being, are all, and cultural practice are central to our identity as Māori, yeah. as you say. So it you know, connects us to place, connects us to our relations and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, for me, in my experience with non-Māori who I've shared some of our kōrero with, what it's done within has really sparked that fire for them to understand them themselves yeah. and their own story, their own narratives and, and how that, and what that means for them. And I think I agree, you know, like ultimately we're wanting to encourage people to understand who they are. Mm, yeah. And also that they have a connection to earth, um, to home, to, to community. Um, and it's just a matter of open that, opening that up and identifying that. I remember we did this um, Pipiha workshop and Precious Clark was on this one. And um, it was with her organisation, actually. It was a government organisation. And uh, we asked them to identify where they come from, you know, in relation to their mountains. And, and there were two people, both from Nigeria, who hadn't had the opportunity to talk to each other. Um, but straight they straight away through identifying their mountains, they found out they lived in neighbouring villages or not far from each other. That they both come from those. So it was, it was just it was just a, a lovely um, example of you know how these processes can help bring people together and connect people. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm thinking about um, you know this journey that you've been on, and um, and I'm thinking about these young people that come over here to the UK and I've been here 20 years now. And I think in that time, there's, there's a new generation that's coming through and they're, they're a lot of them um, are lucky. Or, I don't know if it's lucky, but they've, they speak Maori. Um, they've been brought up uh, with their, I suppose, haka is something that just comes naturally to them. Um, they're confident in themselves. That they come from a place of deficit um, and they're sharing. They're quite generous in their sharing. Um, and the sort of surprise, and I remember uh, Tupotama Paki said to me, um, his parents were shocked when they, when he told them that he was able to come over here and make a living from the things that he was brought up with at home as a child. Um, but then they go back home to Aotearoa. Uh, you know, things aren't seem don't seem so positive in terms of um, how people perceive our culture. I know that's moved; it's changed quite a bit since I was back there. Um, but I don't know, was, in terms of people maintaining resilience and going on this journey and hopefully contributing some of their knowledge in a more formal way, in the way that you do um, within iwi organisations, do you have any um, advice? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think there is some way to go in terms of the broader um, New Zealand public seeing and understanding the value of our culture and our real and our language. Um, and so, you know, I'd love to, to be alive when, you know, our culture and our language is embraced by, by all. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, when we all have a role to play, so those of us that are passionate, that, that have, that feel we're, we have a responsibility and obligation to, 
yeah, we have this, I, I'm, I almost believe we're duty bound to promote our culture in a positive way. Um, and, you know, and not tolerate um, negativity towards our, our culture. Um, now that's, you know, that's quite confronting for people because, you know, New Zealand, unfortunately, and we see it all the time, there's this sort of, the systemic sort of racism, which we've just got to accept that our colonial experience um, has been one whereby there is still not a wide acceptance and acknowledgement of that Māori experience. And so, unfortunately, Māori a lot of the time are, see, are, are feared and our culture is feared yeah. because it's just the lack of understanding. And, you know, there's, of course, there's, there's a range of, yeah, people people across the spectrum, but I think some of it is just out of ignorance. Um, uh, yeah, and latent guilt, I think. Yeah, and a bit of that. And then I think, you know, those that actually have taken the plunge have been bold and courageous to actually, and you're seeing this now with a lot of our real courses and tikanga courses throughout the country, yeah. um, huge enrolments of non-Māori. And, you know, a lot that I've met, it's just, it's really lit a fire within. Yeah. You know, they've, they've actually seen the beauty of our culture, of our language, and they celebrate it and they acknowledge it. And so, you know, we just need more of that to happen. Yeah. I just, I'd want to acknowledge my father at this point because I'm um, just, I re recently got married a year ago and he turned up at Cairo at the Marae um, and gave a speech and, was a, and he spoke in Māori, you know, and that was, he didn't tell us. Um, he went to Wānanga down in um, Wellington. Um, and, and learned this mihi mihi uh, for when we did our um, when he did his speech at our wedding. So, um, yeah, proud of him, proud of the steps that he's taken and just um, stepping into that space, which is not easy, as you say. And also think of people like Andrew Judd, um, you know, who had a really difficult time um, moving into that space. Just just on that, um, I know you're on a lot of boards that um, aren't Maori as well. I'm just thinking of New Zealand Tur Tourism New Zealand as an example. And we do a lot of work for tourism over here in the US and also in the UK uh, and really wonderful people. And, I, and I've just noticed over the last couple of years, there's been this shift in strategy and moving away from the scenery based tourism that you know people are familiar with because of Lord of the Rings um, or the adventure tourism, um, you know, based around Queenstown and other places and really moving to people. Um, so how do you feel about um, this transition and, and, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts? Well, I think, you know, um, having been on the board of Tourism New Zealand for close to sort of seven years now, I mean, what I've seen is the evolution of the the New Zealand proposition, um, both to our global markets and visitors, but also um, here in New Zealand. So the sort of view that we have now is to enrich New Zealand through tourism. And so when we talk about enrich, we talk broadly about, you know, the sort of four capitals. Um, we talk about tourism from the, and tourism growth from the sense of, you know, it's got to be socially inclusive. It's got to be environmentally sustainable. Um, we talk about it's, it's more than just economic contribution, that it's got to enrich the experiences that our communities have and that our, our own New Zealand communities need to value tourism and embrace visitors in terms of an extension of manaakitanga. Um, and so for us, you know, it's it's centred around people in place, which funnily enough, uh, you know, what we discussed earlier, Carla, those those key sort of tenants and key pillars of who we are as Māori, right? Yeah. People in place. And, um, you know, that, that that is something that resonates with not only global um the global markets and tourists, tourists, but also um, within the organisation of Tourism New Zealand. And, you know, it's quite interesting because most global tourists would come to New Zealand as a consequence of our landscapes and, you know, the natural beauty. And nearly, a hundred, you know, 90% of them would leave remembering the people and the experience that they had in engaging with New Zealanders. And so... You know, what we've done is we've sort of over the years, we've pivoted towards, you know, moving beyond landscapes to people in place, but actually focusing on experiences, right? Yeah. 
and so the experience that one has in terms of interaction with people in place. Yeah, this is really interesting because um, I've been doing a couple of presentations on Manaakitanga um, in the past for Tourism New Zealand, and it's not an easy concept to get, you know, and one of the questions that people did ask was, um, was I remember being asked, is this any different from my, my German grandmother, you know, who... And in some ways, it's not, you know. Um, and I've, my grandmother's from Belgium, and she was just a really generous-hearted, um, beautiful woman that um, really loved us. But um, I think the difference, is, and it comes back to what you're just talking about now, it's, it's place, people in place, communities in the landscape, or and connecting back to those things. And now this is, um, again, we're going back to moving away from these generic universal values to something real, you know, something that's more um, aligned to who we really are and sharing that. So it's just interesting that, um, you know, we're able, I suppose we have the confidence to be able to share at that level um, with people who aren't Māori. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, when you are strong in your own identity um, and you are secure in yourself, um it is it gives you confidence not arrogance it gives you confidence because i mean i think and that's something that i i've reflected on that you know if 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 our young people can be and you've probably experienced this with the next generation coming over to london you know when they have that 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 sense of identity that security in this in, in themselves they have the confidence to engage in the world yeah and um and i think you know that's something there's there's a long way to go because a lot of our, our I know our, our families are not in that position, um, but you know there's huge value and benefit, and and you know all of the we I've been involved with, I mean have all had a focus on identity and providing that sort of that that self um, belief within our iwi communities, and that for me is you know drawing upon this tupuna wisdom is inspirational. You know, some of the narratives, some of the quarter, our muddy water framework, Carl, is, it's, it's, it's awesome, you know, because it speaks to maru and, and I, I, I see some of the fun, you know, really, because it's them, it mm. reflects, them, it speaks to them and it's, it becomes real for them. And then you can, you can take that and you can, you, you can live and breathe that, you know, and so a bit like Ngāti Mutunga, we have our, our quarter or about um, Te Puna Koro Pupu. Te maunga titohia and te manawa whenua. So this enduring sort of spring, uh, which speaks about resilience. It speaks about, you know, a spring that will always bubble. So you can reference it to our relationships. You know, it's there There are these metaphors which primarily are all based on the environment, um, which is still relevant for us. Yeah. So we get our inspiration from the natural world. Um, and that again, right, so that's that connection to environment. And... Mm. Um, well, that, yeah, that's, in. The, that's the beauty. We we can continue to inspire our young people with this, with this worldview. Um, what I want to say about the Mamadu framework is, uh, you know, it works on a personal level as well as a community or tribal level. So, just your connection to land. You know, you're talking about the past, the future, um, your external relationships, um, your internal relationships, um, and also up, up as well. You know, tiki tiki. So you just it just covers all those aspects of who we are as communities and individuals. Yeah. Um, so just one other thing, well, a couple of things really, but um, this really interesting phrase, and you know, we pretty much covered it. But if there's anything else you want to say, because I thought it was quite interesting, um, that you said when you spoke with John Tamihiri the other day, um, and the next wave of colonization is the colonization of knowledge. Um, and I think this has really been the topic we've been touching on now. Is, is there anything else you want to say about that? Well, you know, I think um, the capitalists have now realised the untapped potential that exists within the indigenous consciousness and understanding, right? Yeah. And so um, people have seen that this knowledge, this wisdom, this understanding has huge amount of relevance to solve the challenges that the globe faces and i think the risk um, is that um, this knowledge is exploited in a way 
that is detrimental to the knowledge holders. And so I think, you know, which is, I think, that that caution that we have and why knowledge was treated in a tapu way, not, not necessarily just to purely restrict, but to ensure that it is maintained appropriately. Um, I think, you know, collectively we've just got to understand, yeah, I think, I don't want to say risks, but I think understand some of the unintended consequences if we don't lead out and um, and grasp the opportunity that we have to lead to lead the way in this space. Mm. And so for me, it's really kia kore kore e tewi. You know, it's really the opportunity is before us to seize, to, to lead the way, to develop indigenous Māori-inspired frameworks, models, which can be global exemplars. Yeah. Um, less others come in and exploit that knowledge and understanding for their yep. benefit. And reframe it and come up with words which start to change it and recolonize it again. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, for me, sort of uh, recent work I've been doing the last six to nine months looking at, um, you know, sort of impact investment, um, big conservation organizations, um, organizations and funds that have been established to support indigenous communities. Yeah. I think, you know, the the watch out for me is, you know, how might we continue to be true to who we are and and um, and not be exploited. Because I think, yeah. you know, that, that's the last thing. And Tohu and Tefiti used to speak about this, you know, which which was something that the government didn't like because the the level of conviction and resilience that they had in terms of being able to maintain the strength of mind and heart of our people. Um, you know, they, they, they said, you know, they, they can take our lands, our material things, but they'll never take these elements, yeah. these aspects he, inside. He mangu mangu taipo. Nei hoki tata, koia. Um, I think the, in some ways the answer to that is uh, to go out and do it ourselves uh, and do it at the highest possible standard that we can. Um, so that, because there were people who, who will copy and will try to follow. Um, and it's just, um, I don't know, either we bring them on board so that they are able to sort of help their journey or we show them for what they are in terms of um, they're not doing it right. Mm. Uh, and well, the people... So I think, you know, it's how we do it in, with integrity and, and in an authentic way, yeah. um, which we know. And so it's really, it's, it's in our hands, you know. And okay. so, you know, if anything, my message, Carl, to a lot of our whanau that may be listening is, you know, kia kaha tato. We've actually got to act, you know, we've got to, we can do it. Good point. Um, this is a personal question I want to finish on. Um, we're nearly 10 o'clock, but I just want to say, well, just a mihi to you. Thanks for, um, I know you've been involved in a lot of stuff with Ngāti Maru. I know you're Ngāti Maru as well, but also a busy person. I'm really pleased to see the progress that's been made. Uh, with Ngāti Maru over the last couple of months, I mean, with the last iwi and Taranaki to settle, um, and just feeling like that completion of that process, you know, subject to the iwi's uh, approval, of course, um, will just sort of put us back with our, you know, take us forward again as, as Taranaki as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so just any thoughts on that? I, just also really important, I think, part of that process for me is just seeing the connections that we've made with our neighbours again. And for a long time, um, you know, Pūrangi was just a day's walk from the Wanganui River. And they still walk that all the time. And, and you know, there'd be generations where we'd pop over and marry and then pop back and marry. And so I have a lot of connections to um, Wanganui, as I'm sure you do as well. Um, but those relationships seem to be coming alive again as a result of this process. Um, but, yeah, any, any final thoughts on, on, the, on Ngāti Maru and the claims process? I think I'm proud of our Maru Fano, bro. You know, like I'm really proud of our our Maru Fano for being having the courage to actually want to do this. Because um, you know, I think when I when I look at our Maru history, you know, and as you know full well, I think the fact that you know um, the leadership which you're a part you were a part of in terms of taking that step again to want to engage in this process, but doing it in a way where we've been true to Ngāti Maru, um, where at every opportunity have looked to reaffirm, re-establish, 
those relationships that you know in, in the past sort of assisted us um i've really i've just really loved and enjoyed working with our whanau um and i think you know although we're the last iwi to settle i think there are some benefits yeah people might say with well, the opportunity costs but i think you know there's a time for everything and um this has been ngati maru's time our moment and i think you know we've done it in a way where we've united maru through the process and we've reaffirmed and re-established those relationships you know i think all of our maru negotiators are probably all as much uh from ngati hau and wanganui as we are from ngati maru um and so i see you know this is just the foundation and the platform um for a for things to come kia maru tike tike um you know and i think just having that self-belief in who we are and what we can achieve and i'm really excited by the future for maru Kopai. all right uh well tēnā koutou i tiwi um just want to say thank you for listening in um as is and just a special mihi to mr jamie tuta for coming on our show um, and just sharing your um, knowledge. I just, I think it was kind of overwhelming in some bits there, Jamie, just thinking like the depths of what you were saying and uh, well, not just depths up there as well. Um, but also, you know, I think the challenge for us moving forward is to make sure we come, uh, we can do it in a way which is real and um, has a real impact on the way we, we manage our resources and, uh, you know, on the people at, in the, at the end of the day. Um, so I just want to acknowledge you uh, for coming on here. But um, as, as is traditional, it's, I'm going to leave it this, the waiata for you to um, finish off in, in the last mihi. Kia ora. Oh, well, kia ora, kia ora, Carl. I'll do a, I'll do a little um, ngeri. Um, and this ngeri is called uh, Ko Waitara. Um, and it speaks about the fact that Waitara was where the war began, um, but also speaks about when... You know, when we get when we get through and past Waitara, uh, we can move forward. So, Anne, a ko Waitara, ko Waitara, ko te rā te nei mate ai te wenu ai mate ai te tangata. O kape we tata we te iwi kua hiwe a re re ti ane te wenu ai raro iho tata kumu. Katorona ke tia ki runga ki te maunga tei tei Au e pakia i te mea kua Tutakina nei Ka hore he tangata mana e huaki I te mea kua uakina nei Ka ore e tangata mana e tutaki Ka uakina Ka uakina Ka tohungi a e au he tangata mo te au he ruru rā nei e koi a tēnā. He ngē rā nei e koi a tēnā. He ngā rā rā nei e koi a tēnā. E koi a tēnā. E koi a tēnā. Ha. Good point. Tēnā koe, Jamie. Tēnā koe tu katoa.